good evening everyone and uh, good morning to uh, professor christian sixta rainhat and miss chris uh, mcguffey uh, i am prashant kumar sharma an assistant professor at the department of political science vidhan chandra college affiliated to the university of kolkata i on behalf of the department of political science and iqac warmly welcome you all to this international webinar entitled uh, aspects of online terrorism uh, countering measures to be taken this webinar has been organized by the department of political science in association with the internal quality assurance cell iqac of our institution we have got with us professor uh, christian sixter reinhardt uh, director of academic program assessment palmetto college and uh, and professor of political science usc union university of south carolina usa and ms chris mcguffey Uh, research director of Spectrum Labs, uh, California, USA, as a distinguished resource persons for this international webinar. Ma'am, I thank you all for being with us. Uh, may I now request uh, to the head of our institution, Dr. Ramesh Kaur, Vice Principal Sir, to kindly deliver a formal welcome address. Sir, now it's over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone, our uh, respected, our uh, distinguished, our uh, research person, honourable, our uh, dignitaries. dear colleague research scholars convener of the webinars hod and affectionate students it is really a great pleasure and privilege to be present in the international webinar organized by the department of political science in association with iqac vidhan chandra college risura being the head of the institute i must congratulate the students and teachers of the department of political science especially hod professor devdas de and convener professor kushan kumar sharma as they have taken initiative to organize the international webinar first of all i on behalf of institute must welcome the respected uh, research person uh, professor uh, christian Sixta Renihat, Director of Academic Program Assessment, uh, Palmetto College, Professor of Political Science, USC Union, University of South Carolina, USA, and Ms. Chris McGoffey, Research Director, Spectrum Lab, California, USA. I would be immensely grateful as they have. that they have responded to our invitation despite their busy schedule i also convey my best wishes to our governing body president and all governing body member for their moral support for conducting the international webinars i do hope that our participant would reap a sound harvest from the international uh, webinars i firmly believe that the this discussion will be interesting and interactive one the survey of the despite and reciprocal discussion i do hope that would further illumine the minds of the teachers and taught i wish a warm success of the webinar once again thanking you all and thank you very much sir thank you very much for the welcome address uh, may i now introduce to our distinguished chair of this international webinar professor christine sixta uh, reinhardt ma'am uh, for me it is indeed an honor to introduce uh, such an internationally acclaimed academician and personality uh, professor christine sixta reinhardt is director of academic program assessment of palmetto college uh, she joined this college in 2014 Uh, she is professor of political science at academic affairs usc union university of south carolina usa professor kristin holds a phd from the university of south carolina in political science particularly in international relations and comparative politics she regularly teaches classes on american government state government of america and the south carolina government the american chief executive psychology and politics us foreign policy and social movements and interest groups as far as research is concerned she focuses on terrorism and counter terrorism she particularly focuses on uav unmanned aerial vehicle targeted killing and uh, 
international terrorist organizations and female terrorists professor christine christine has written several books on on these aspects of on, on these aspects of terrorism some of uh, those books are sexual jihad the, the role of islam in female terrorism which published in 2019 uh, drones and targeted killings in the middle east and africa and appraisal of american counter terrorism policies which published in 2018 and volatile social movements and the origins of terrorism the radicalization of change which published in 2014 Ma'am, I most humbly request you to kindly chair this session. Uh, Ma'am, now it's uh, over to you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to chair this. I, I'm really honored to do this. And wow, that was a, a quite an introduction. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'm Christine Reinhardt, and it's my honor and privilege to produce uh, Ms. Chris McGuffey. I'm going to go ahead and um, read her her qualifications here. Uh, Chris McGuffey is an extremism and disinformation researcher with a background in international security and nonproliferation. Currently applying her experiences uh, to trust and safety priorities in the development and application of artificial intelligence detection models. At Spectrum Labs, Chris directs research on toxic behaviors and real-life harms, aligns behavioral definitions with human rights and free speech standards, and collaborates across teams to develop fresh approaches to identifying harmful dynamics on platforms. Outside of Spectrum, her current research is focused on the confluence of conspiracy theories and violent extremism, the connections between online influence and violence, and the prevalence of violent misogyny online. She is a former deputy director of the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, where she partnered with online platforms to evaluate and mitigate harmful trends, including hate speech and online radicalization. Her previous research, including working with OpenAI to evaluate GPT2, GPT2, and GPT3. Two language generation models. That sounds really cool, by the way. Uh, for risks associated with nefarious application of such technologies by violent extremists. And so, Chris, it's an honor to uh, introduce you, and the stage is now yours. Also, um, please uh, keep your comments until the end, and I'll try and answer them and, and help Chris with them in the Google chat. Right, Prashant? Is that correct? Okay. Thank you very much. It's all yours. Thank you so much. And yeah, it was a lot of fun to evaluate GPT-2 and GPT-3. Um, so thank you all for inviting me here today. I'm really happy to be speaking to your college and to all the other guests who may be joining from other locations as well. As you know, I'm going to talk about countering terrorism online. Just like the rest of us, terrorists are online using the same communication tools that we do every day, and they're doing so to achieve their goals across the world. This reality leaves counterterrorism itself and prevention work in the hands of technology companies. Much like governments, technology companies must work to deter terrorist actors and minimize the effect that they have when they do exploit platforms and interact with the general public. Technology companies, of course, have a lot of interesting tools for this, but they don't always have the specialized expertise into terrorist behaviors. But fortunately, some of the best practices that are used offline when it comes to counterterrorism can be applied within online spaces. Tools for detecting and moderating very harmful terrorist content are improving every day. And collaboration um, that's happening already between tech companies and experts practitioners, researchers, government entities, and law enforcement will only improve the approaches that we have right now. Before talking a bit about all the details, I wanna set the stage um, with a few definitions so you all understand um, what I'm talking about when I use these terms. So terrorism itself, there is a lot of confusion even within terrorism studies about this word. Terrorism is a tactic. It's something that violent extremists do to accomplish a goal. So much of what I'm going to talk about today is addressing all the ways that violent extremists themselves exploit online communities 
um, to accomplish their goals and how we can actually stop them. Online, we all know what online means, but I want to push forward the notion that online has truly become a place for us all to gather, a place for us to interact, not just a tool like any other technology tool that we use. In the past, we might have just looked at terrorists exploiting online spaces as just another means of accomplishing their goals. But I believe that we're rightfully shifting this idea um, in order to really accommodate what's happening, which is that violent extremists are influencing people in online as much and sometimes more so than they are offline. Plenty of terrorist offenders have actually committed acts of terrorism or contributed to a terrorist cause without ever having met a real life terrorist in person. And in some cases, without ever formally joining a terrorist group or being a part of a formal terrorist movement. And the move to what people are now calling Web3, the more immersive virtual reality form of being online will only make all of this much more real. Finally, violent extremism. Um, what I want um, everyone to kind of understand about this is that it's a way of thinking that requires that the extremists believe that others who don't share their beliefs must have violence committed against them and in order to ensure their survival. So violent extremists don't just think that others should have their rights taken away. They believe in violence as a necessary tactic. Not every violent extremist, of course, will become a terrorist, but their belief system requires violence. So now that we've established that terrorism is a tactic um, and it's a tactic that's used by, by violent extremists, that online spaces are actual places where people interact and get influenced in much the same way that we all do in person in the physical realm. And we know that violent extremists believe that their survival requires violence against those who don't share their beliefs. We can get into more specifics. First, how terrorists actually leverage online spaces. Now, I could spend a lot of time in a series of conversations talking to you about every single way that terrorists might exploit online spaces, but I'm going to talk to you about the most common ways. And that begins with sharing violent extremist propaganda and the reasons that violent extremist propaganda are shared. One, in order to garner support. Two, to influence others. And I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail because there's a number of different ways to use violent extremist propaganda to influence. Three, recruitment. Actually trying to get people to join a movement or join a violent extremist group. Then there's also five, radicalization itself. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by radicalization. And finally, and most concerningly, is mobilization into violence, sharing violent extremist propaganda in order to make people take violent action in the real world. So violent extremists use online spaces in much the same way they do physical spaces, except they benefit more from the speed and the volume of what occurs online. This is why counterterrorism online must work at a different pace than an offline work. Harmful propaganda can be shared far and wide really, really quickly. We all understand this. We all have seen things go viral. And violent extremists know this too, and they take advantage of it. Um, and in terms of that influence, when something that's shared by a violent extremist is going viral, there's a larger concern for things like copycat crimes, people actually copying the type of violence they're seeing um, glorified or promoted or even actually completed in terms of sharing videos of violence. Support and recruitment. So violent extremists use propaganda to, um, to get support, to make other people actually believe and think and feel in ways that will benefit their cause very directly. So it's very strategic. Remember that a lot of propaganda of any type is full of false and misleading information. 
And of course, there's the element when it comes to violent extremist propaganda of hateful opinions being packaged up as fact. So this is where disinformation and violent extremism collide again and again. Let's talk about influence for a minute. And there's negative influence and there's positive influence and there's something that's resembling even more neutral kind of influence. When it comes to something that's a little bit more neutral, remember, violent extremists don't even have to get people to support their cause, to influence them, to share their propaganda. And this is something that they take advantage of again and again. There are people who innocently share violent extremist ideas and content without understanding its meaning. And this is a tactic that's exploited a lot. Also, when it comes to influence, particularly negative influence, um, this type of content can be used to actually terrorize other people. Um, people who are never going to support violent extremist causes, but if they come across it online, um, will actually decide to stay away from the platforms where it's showing up. And in this way, violent extremists are also um, completing one of their goals, which is to influence and cause harm to people. And of course, we know there's positive influence, at least from the violent extremist mindset, which is sometimes when they share their propaganda, including really violent propaganda, they're going to get supporters, people who enjoy this type of content people who feel inspired or empowered by it. The so-called Islamic State accomplished this quite a bit with a lot of gory and really horrifying photos and videos of terrorist violence. Right-wing extremists do this as well, and they've actually borrowed some of the tactics of the Islamic State. Um, on the far right, you will see not only graphic imagery and videos, but a lot of memes, a lot of jokes related to hateful propaganda, um, bits and pieces, excerpts from mass shooter manifestos and similar content being shared, all to influence others. All right, let's talk about radicalization and mobilization. So as some of you might know, there are a lot of different theories of radicalization. And some of the more traditional elements of radicalization do, do still actually um, take place online. And that's, in, in a nutshell, it's basically a process. Radicalization is a process um, through which people are changing what they believe. And when it comes to radicalization and to violent extremism, they change their belief systems enough to become convinced that violent extremism is acceptable that violence must be committed against others who don't share your beliefs. Um, and, and we do know this is happening and it's studied, but we also know that there is some truth in emerging uh, literature and research that people who aren't even fully radicalized into a given ideology can be influenced to take horrific violent action and even commit terrorism. So an example of this is when, um, when the Islamic State had a caliphate and there were foreign fighters joining, flying across the world to actually join the cause. Some of those people um, seemed to be attracted more to the identity that they were taking on, the identity shared in the very flashy propaganda. Um, the identity of a fighter for a supposedly noble cause. And we know this in part because some of those people actually do not and never really adapted to the specific form of extreme and hateful political Islamism that the Islamic State was preaching at the time. We have similar examples with far right extremism people who don't necessarily align with a specific type of far-right extremist ideology or doctrine um, committing horrific acts of violence. Um, and again, some of those people seem to be more impressed with taking on the identity of someone who um, sends a message to society, who um, holds up um, the power of their arsenal, um, and really kind of takes on 
that as the reason for committing violence more so than any specific belief system. So in summary, because what violent extremists are doing online is strikingly similar to what they do offline, counterterrorism practices that work in offline spaces can be adapted. So I'm gonna dive into what those look like in online spaces specifically. There's two pieces to remember to begin with, prevention and deterrence. And for those of you who've spent much time in terms of international security notions, this will be familiar. The prevention I'm talking about online is really more about strengthening the individuals and the groups of people and the systems um, in order to build resistance against violent extremist tactics and their content. When it comes to deterrence online, it's all about making it harder for violent extremists to accomplish their goals. So the notion is you raise the costs of taking bad action and you reduce the benefits. Remember that influencing other people and finding supporters, radicalizing people, recruiting them, and attempting to mobilize them into taking violent action, it takes time and resources. And some of those resources include money, of course. So by making it harder for people to take these actions and by reducing the reach of online influence, by doing things like deplatforming them, automatically deleting the content that they try to share, moderating and disrupting the flow of their content, and by forcing them into alternative online spaces that are smaller and have fewer people to influence, you can actually change the decision-making calculus for violent extremists in terms of how much time and energy and money they'll actually try to spend accessing people through platforms. The smaller their reach and the more disrupted their attempts to influence people, the smaller the likelihood that they will actually inspire others into accepting their hateful belief systems or to committing violence. On the individual level, there's something called inoculation theory, also called pre-bunking, um, that's sometimes proposed as a means of building individuals' resistance against harmful content, such as that which is shared by violent extremists. So because it's called inoculation theory, you can imagine that the notion is just like vaccines preventing us from disease. In essence, it involves warning people about how their belief systems might be challenged and then exposing them to a weakened form of that challenge to their belief system. So in this way, they've already been prepared for exposure to hateful and violent rhetoric and the often simplistic thinking that violent extremists are using to radicalize and mobilize people. Groups and platforms online can be built as well with an eye towards preventing bad actors from ever gaining traction on a given site. There are patterns in the behaviors of violent extremists and there are common tactics that can be studied and guarded against. Some of those tactics, of course, are specific to a given ideology within a given time period or language or culture. However, it's important to remember that there are tactics that have been around and been used for decades. Persuasion online and persuasion offline have very similar patterns. And by catching extremist content in the very early stages of what's deployed in order to influence people, you can prevent that complete process of what will be increasingly hateful and violent and alarming propaganda to grow um, and to proliferate, pro proliferate online. And that's what you're actually um, doing to disrupt that, catching it really early. So those early signs there, and this is where um, a lot of the work that I do in my, my daily life um, are related to this. So when it comes to violent extremist propaganda specifically, early signs include hate speech, but it's a particular type of hate speech that you'll see commonly. It's more subtle hate speech. It won't necessarily be just a straightforward attack against another um, people group, 
um, or necessarily a slur. It will be content that promotes or glorifies discrimination, for example. It could be content that alleges the superiority of one group over another. It could be content that argues that certain categories of people should be denied basic human rights. Or it could be content that frames certain people as being defective. So it's more subtle. All of this, however, it are signs of activity on a platform that relates to core elements of violent extremist belief systems. So just like medical doctors eradicate the early signs of cancer developing in a human body, uh, platforms can manage those early signs of violent extremist content um, before it becomes a massive problem and essentially poisons a given platform or a group on that platform. Bigger picture, in online spaces, there are structural elements to consider, literally the way a platform is designed and the way we as users interact within a platform, the way moderators um, interact, and all of that relates to structure. There are policy elements. Those are the user guidelines, the rules um, that we have to adhere to when we actually are on a specific platform. There is the detection approaches. Um, so that's part of the work that I do in my daily life is um, helping to train AI detection in order to make it smarter um, at detecting all sorts of different behaviors, but those include the behaviors associated with violent extremism. And then there's moderation. Moderation can be done automatically um, using automated methods, on, and it also can be done by humans. The best approaches use both forms of moderation. Um, and also enforcement. Again, there's automated enforcement and there's human enforcement and the strongest systems employ both. All of these elements um, contribute to prevention of violent extremism content online. There are a few core pieces, though, that are really powerful, and they're very common sense, but people sometimes forget about them. First, the essence is that you have to have a really diverse workforce in order to be effective with countering terrorism online. Um, that's as crucial for developing really sound policy as it is for labeling the data that's used to train artificial intelligence models as it is for actually analyzing platform content um, or even just enforcing platform rules. If you don't have a diverse workforce working on this, you're always going to have blind spots. Worse, sometimes you'll have bias that actually does damage along with the damaging content. So you have to have a variety of different people from different places with different language and cultural understanding, different areas of specialty. It's essential to counterterrorism online. You also need systems and tools that are very adaptable and adjustable. And by adjustable, I mean real-time adjustments. Time is of the essence when it comes to blocking horrific content and preventing its spread. Because you want to actually prevent virality of this type of content. So as soon as there's identification of a new and harmful violent extremist trend, that needs to be addressed immediately within the larger system. So that means all the tools and structures already need to be in place in order for that adjustment to occur. Also, even though it's maybe not as exciting to a lot of people, it's exciting to me, data collection and analysis. So when that's actually happening on a given platform regularly, and what I'm really talking about is that platforms can take responsibility for understanding the nature of the data, the content, the user-generated content that's flowing across their platform, then they have a baseline of this is what people talk about, this is how people are interacting. Um, this, of course, requires having researchers and analysts in place who are essentially experts on what the data on a given platform looks like and sounds like. That way, when this is already in place, real life events that occur, such as a violent event or political upheaval, a natural disaster, 
a global pandemic, as we have seen. Um, when these things happen, and they will happen, we know that violent extremists will take advantage of them every single time. It's a standard tactic. So when data is already being collected and something big happens in the world, then everything is in place to evaluate how that data is changing. We've seen this more recently with Russia invading Ukraine. Platforms had to all of a sudden deal with a different type of content. Some of it was hate speech, some of it was graphic imagery. They had to respond very quickly. And it was a new and distinctive type of data. But when you have people in place to accommodate that data collection and analysis, then you can respond in real time to those trends. There's also mitigation. By mitigation, I'm really speaking more about what happens to reduce harm once that violent extremist content does get posted and shared. So we can't prevent it all from showing up online and we can't actually deter all violent extremists from using online spaces. So in this way, mitigation is more about how we equip the platforms and users with the tools they need to remain as safe and unaffected as possible, even when bad actors succeed in sharing truly horrific content, like live streaming a terrorist event or sharing photos or manifestos, the worst of the worst content um, that platforms um, have nightmares about essentially, because it is, um, it is really, really high risk, high harm. This is where building healthier and resilient platforms and communities of people online really helps. So part of community resilience online is encouraging the same positive behaviors online that we value and that we praise in everyday life. That this doesn't of course mean that um, we want people to share too much of themselves or share private information that could leave them vulnerable. What we're really talking about is setting um, better norms of conduct that um, elevates the notion of, I'm walking through the world as Chris McGuffey in my community, and then when I go online, I'm the same person. I behave by the same rules. Um, and this is what I'm talking about with building resilience, because part of what makes us vulnerable online is showing up and allowing others to show up as different people where they can hide behind anonymity in ways that somehow shields them from moral or ethical responsibility for their behavior. When more platforms elevate this notion of be who you are with the same rules of conduct, uh, um, in, in online spaces, then we will see others who are not behaving that way much more rapidly. And it won't just take some horrific element of violent extremist content to wake us up to a problem that we have. So this is also where making respect and tolerance normal in online communities is really important. We can actually make it normal to share universal values like human rights, the right to human dignity, the right to social participation. When more people and more platforms recognize that we're actually better for creating online spaces that are safe and interesting for lots of different types of people, um, for us all to discuss, to learn, to play games together, to engage with one another without fear of being targeted for who we are, for the color of our skin, for what religion we practice, what gender identity we have, for who we love or who we marry, the less power we give to people who glorify violence and hate. And those are violent extremists. Um, we can make toxic extremist content less harmful by being stronger and less persuadable, by being healthy and existing within very functional online spaces. Finally, I wanna go over the elements of what really gives me hope about countering uh, violent extremism and, and terrorist content online. We know that there's going to be more content in the future, that there's already content out there, but there really are a lot of causes 
for hope that I want to share with you. Um, one, what's high risk for companies is also something that's significantly harmful for all of us individual users online. In this way, there's a wonderful incentive for platforms to actually reduce harms to all of us um, while reducing the risks that they're already going to be in the process of doing um, to their company because risk management is already an established framework. And in this way, there is incentive for risk management to encompass reducing harms. Two, the, there are technology companies that build the tech, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, that other companies that host us all online need. And again, there are incentives for those two types of companies to work together really closely because they need one another. And that also gives me a lot of hope because there's a synergy there that's really important to getting better at countering terrorism online. Third, all of the subject matter experts, and there are a lot of different types of people, um, from academics to independent researchers to journalists who really understand terrorist behavior online, those folks benefit from educating technology companies and informing um, government entities and assisting law enforcement. So again, there are built-in incentives with all the stakeholders in this space um, to work together more closely. Finally, number four, and the one that I think is the most hopeful is young adults, digital natives. Um, all of you who are of a certain generation and have grown up online are so much more aware of the problems of online spaces. And you tend to have more of a sense of responsibility to help fix those problems. Some of the best researchers and journalists who study terrorist behaviors online are young adults. And the generations with the most natural insights into technology and into online culture are also the ones who have some of the biggest reasons to solve these issues. This is why one of the best things that we can do from a policy perspective and from a strategic perspective is put the power into the hands of younger adults and give them the resources to help innovate and to help us solve these problems. This is one of the reasons I'm here speaking to you all today. You are our hope in terms of countering violent extremism in the longer term, getting really good at this. Ultimately, one way or another, you will pick up the pieces of wherever older generations have fallen short or, fa or, or actually failed. Um, and I have no doubt that you'll do a better job than we have. So, I hope this gives you a better sense, an overview of online counterterrorism um, with some helpful and I hope hopeful things to think about. Um, please know that whether you choose to just remain interested in this topic or you actually want to work in countering terrorism online in industry and in academia and government and non-government organizations, there are just a lot of ways to make it harder for hate and violence to persist in the world. Um, and thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. And I see we've got questions. Um, I, I've been kicked off several times, so I think I'm gonna keep my camera off so I can stay on. And if I, if I get kicked off, Prashant, can you go ahead and take over for me? Um, okay, so. Ma'am, do you want me to take the questions for Chris, ma'am? Um, I think, yeah, why don't you go ahead because I've been kicked off five times now. If you would, please, okay, I'll sit here and try and add, if I can add anything. Okay. So, uh, we have several questions. Uh, one question is from uh, our student. As he's saying, a respected professor, ma'am, how can we identify real perpetrators? in the era of fake or mask account? Yeah, so that is where um, a combination of content analysis, where subject matter expertise comes in, in terms of understanding specific types of content associated, and my cat's joining us, 
where the specific belief systems and um, violent extremist uh, groups and movements combined with what those of us in the trust and safety industry um, talk about as behavioral detection. So it's a combination of understanding. Let me give you an example. Um, in the West, we've had a lot of far right violent extremist attacks, mass shooter events. There are common ideas that show up in manifestos and among individual users praising these belief systems. So that would be on the content side. And this is something that you can actually set up within a system to make sure that you are flagging content that's associated with this um, violent extremist belief system. But then the other element is that those who are participating in effective trust and safety are already doing so on a behavioral basis. So this is one of the reasons that I brought up um, hate speech. Hate speech is often a proxy for violent extremist behaviors. So if on one hand you are already actually helping to program your detection systems to certain types of hateful content associated with different groups and movements, and you also have systems in place to detect things like hate speech, violent rhetoric, um, weapons discussions, and other types of concerning behaviors, then the combination of the behaviors um, occurring and the content occurring at the same time will immediately alert a given platform that there's a high likelihood of violent extremist content or behavior occurring. And that layering is what helps the most effective platforms in addressing the content that we're all concerned with, the content that impacts us the most before it can take off and be viral and be shared everywhere, which as we know, unfortunately, happens from time to time that, that platforms get surprised, unfortunately, by certain types of content. Okay, thank you, Ma'am. Uh, we have another questions, not another. We have several questions from Professor uh, Samindra Mohan Bishwas. Samindra Mohan Bishwas is our, uh, our colleague uh, at the Department of History. He is asking, uh, there, is, there is an internet site called dark wave through which many horrific acts are committed. So is there any mechanism to block and take preventive measures against them? So a specific uh, URL are we talking about here? Like an actual website? Yeah, ma'am, he's talking about internet site called dark wave uh, through which many horrific, uh, many horrific oh, yes. acts are committed. Right, yes. So, um, okay. Two things here, the dark web and the, and some people are referring to the deep web, the non-indexed web is for sure where the most illicit horrific content um, is occurring. Criminal acts, sharing of horrific um, content of all types, not just violent extremist content, um, human trafficking, drug sales, all sorts of hor horrible things we have on the deep web and dark web. And those of us who evaluate behaviors of terrorists um, have ways, of course, of seeing where this content in the non-index web that have nothing in place, of course, for content management or trust and safety, what that looks like. So there's a couple things um, related to that. One is this is where effective researchers are figuring out terrorist behaviors. You go to the places safely with lots of tools, do not do this at home without having training, um, to find where people who are doing illicit and harmful things are actually interacting online. And you take that information to formulate an understanding um, of how to detect it on platforms that do have moderation, that do have policies and rules. Um, so that's part of actually what makes um, those adjustments that I mentioned of both the content and the behaviors so fruitful is having a real understanding of where that content is persisting. And so then you can go to places where people don't want that content and tweak your systems. But there's also an element of links. And links to deep web and dark web locations can be automatically um, detected and blocked in a lot of cases. 
Now there's a lot of argument about free speech and approaches, but ultimately, whenever we're on an online platform, say we're on Twitter or on Facebook or we're on TikTok, just like when we go to a store or a theater, um, we are going by the rules of that place. And so the notion is some places are very, very restrictive. If they find out, for example, that there is a pocket of users on a given platform that are sharing links to deep web or dark web locations, they can set up a system and it's well within their right to do so to automatically block or remove that content so other users don't see it. So there are very tricky ways to make sure and that is why when I mentioned trends analysis being so important because you have to understand the content, you have to understand the behavior um, and part of that content is trying to get people off moderated platforms and into more dangerous places where there is no moderation. Um, and you can do both. Of course, the only thing that we can really do about dark web and deep web locations is by getting other technology companies to not host them. And from time to time, this does happen. Um, I won't mention them because I don't want to bring attention to them. But after certain terrorist events, there have been examples of companies deciding I'm not going to host your site anymore. And then for a little while, a dangerous platform doesn't exist. Now, in invariably, they will find someone to host them, but that is extremely disruptive and helpful to us in the counterterrorism space. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it is, also, it is also from Professor Sahin Samindra Mohan Bishwas. He is writing, uh, there is a recurring problem. There is a recurring problem of hacking sensitive data from sensitive places. It seems the hackers, it seems the hackers who can also be termed as online terrorists seem to outsmart, outsmart even the smartest. What steps can be taken against them? In terms of hacking. Well, I will say hacking itself is not my area of expertise, but it goes hand in hand with the other types of um, systematic approaches to managing a platform. So just like a platform needs to have rules, needs to have detection and moderation and enforcement, um, it also needs to have security in place to prevent hacking. and also fail safe so that when a site is hacked, there's real time um, fallback plans to keep people safe. And we've seen this a lot in terms of real world events. Um, and we're never of course going to out hack everybody. Um, but this is why governments hire people who are really good at preventing hacking. Um, but this is also a good point. This actually goes hand in hand because it's not always just horrific content that shows up or some terrorist event being live streamed. It's also a way to actually um, infiltrate platforms and make people, it's another way to make people feel terrorized. If they feel vulnerable that their information is being accessed, that their favorite platforms are unsafe, this is another tactic. But again, it comes back to anticipating this, just like you do in the other realms of international security. Um, and we do, there's a lot of disagreement about this, but this is why a lot of people use the term cyber war or cyber warfare, because hacking and um, attacking sites, taking sites down, um, sharing and releasing um, private information is a tactic that's used um, and it's used by bad actors for a number of reasons. And so along with everything that I mentioned today, it's so crucial to have extremely secure uh, sites that not only can withstand hacking, um, but when they can't prevent it completely, have a way to reduce the harm from hacking. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thirdly, uh, Professor Samindra Mohan uh, Biswas is saying that you spoke of violent propaganda. So even the women are even the even the women are brainwashed, and many have joined the ISIS. So who frequently take to online rec, rec, online recourse to recruits? 
so what are the measures the western countries are contemplating against these things yeah um i will add not just women but children and sometimes especially children this is very common in particular um in really violent um terrorist groups on the far right to target uh young people as 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 young as 13 14 years old so this is where having your eyes wide open about all of the tactics even ones that maybe don't get as much attention in terms of research i would argue that um, one of the benefits of countering terrorism online is that the information that you're going from is current um, the approaches with open source research, with accessing what's already public and identifying what's actually happening instead of that lag time that often occurs with offline counterterrorism that's often based on, well, these things happened and then let's study it and then we have some great research and some great books being published, but there's this horrific lag time. When it comes to online, counterterrorism um, and the actual terrorist activity, it is real time. People can collect information right now and they do. They will go to specific platforms. I won't name them and shame them, but there are platforms where there's terrorist activity and terrorist recruitment every single day. And there are ways to collect information and evaluate in real time, including the targeting of women, and including the targeting of underage users. Um, and that's where we have to get really savvy. And we have to go beyond, oh, we know that terrorists use women and children in particular, not only as part of their movement, to, but to actually help spread their movement and ideas. But we have to get specific. Where do they find these people? Well, are they finding people on a, on a gaming platform? Are they finding people on a communications app? Are they finding people on large social media platforms through some loophole? Um, and that's where getting really specific about where and how is the work that actually has to be done. Because otherwise, we can only look in retrospect and say, oh my goodness, they recruited and mobilized a whole bunch of women or in children, what do we do now? We have to be identifying it in real time before and basically stopping them before they continue. Because once they have a little bit of success on a given platform with a certain set of people, they will put all of their efforts into that platform and those people. We saw this with, this, with the Islamic State. This is why a few years back, the larger social media entities hired a bunch of people who specialized in um, violent extremism of that type of genre. And they, a lot of those academics ended up working for the big social media entities and they were able to start really blocking and taking down Islamic State content. Um, but they were slower to do the same thing with far right terrorists. Um, and we're seeing this horrible game of catch up now where they are, they'll cover one area and not another. Um, but you have to be serious about the fact that where they fail on one platform or in one industry, they will find another loophole. And once you know that, you have to get specific about where and how and who um, in order to stop them. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another commentary from Professor Praveer Kanti Basu. Uh, he is the HOD of the Department of English at our institutions. He is writing, in order to kill the monsters, states very often become monsters. Red in tooth and claw, states impose draconian laws to, to combat terrorism and the citizenry are subjected to discrimination and torture behind the war, bars. Ma'am, what do you want to say about it? Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, some of our biggest failings in counterterrorism policy um, and prevention work were people who did not fully understand the problem, people with their own biases, um, people with horrific blind spots, putting into motion discriminatory and restrictive um, measures that actually created more terrorism than it prevented. And there has been rightful um, attention to this issue and the need to shift um, not only how we talk about 
what we need to put into place, but to get real about what actually works, what's proven to work, and what's been proven to be an absolute disaster when it comes to policy. Um, we've seen this particularly, I'm familiar with it in the West in terms of everything that followed 9-11 was a big rush to put things into place. And some of that rush involves um, really invasive, discriminatory policies and systems. And it didn't work. In fact, it made the problem worse. And so this is where going back to one of the early points I made, hiring a diverse workforce, truly understanding the nature of what these issues look like. Um, one of the things I'm a proponent of is you obviously have to, as a country on that level, have a certain stance, a counterterrorism stance. And we all expect that from the, com the countries that we're part of, that our country has an approach. However, the real work that's done is on the community level. Um, it's on the community municipal level offline. It's on the community level online with a given platform um, or a given company that controls a number of platforms. And this is where getting very real about what is and isn't happening is so important. Um, and it's really shameful, some of the practices that became common, including just putting more emphasis on mosques, as if people who um, look a certain way, who practice a certain faith, are, should be, fall under a cloud of suspicion for terrorism. It's a, it's a terrible practice. It has no bearing in reality and it shows a laziness in terms of analysis. Understand what's high risk, understand what these behaviors look like, understand how people are influenced, and then when you start approaching these issues, you're, you're approaching them based on fact and strategy. Um, one of the systems in the West that I like to look towards in terms of prevention and reintegration work is Denmark. No, no country is perfect, and I'm not saying that Denmark is perfect, but they do have an established pattern where they adapted a crime prevention approach from the 1980s, and they adapted that to be a terrorism prevention and reintegration approach in the past decade or so. And it's based on understanding really well what's actually happening and putting things in place at every level of the system in order to address it early and often. And therefore, if you are already approaching your society in a way where you understand what is valued and what is not, then you don't allow something to metastasize and become a horrific problem and then react in the wrong way without factual information. So yeah, I'm in agreement. We make monsters out of the uh, government entities when they move forward without the information they need to do a good job with counterterrorism. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another question from uh, Mr. Aritra Matra. He's, he's saying uh, there are various innocent people uh, who are who aren't tax savvy, and as a result, they fall prey to online terrorism. How to solve this issue? Um. I'm trying to see if that particular one is in, is that one in the chat as well? Yes, ma'am. Is that particular it's in the question? Chat. Yeah, it's in the chat. Okay, could you repeat box. that again? I'm not uh, seeing it yet. Yeah. I'm saying uh, there are various, there are various innocent people who, who are yeah. not tech savvy, okay? And as a result, they fall prey to online terrorism. How to solve yes. this issue? Yeah, the vulnerabilities. Yeah, well, and this is where prevention is all about strengthening that. So we, there's a lot of rather unhelpful disagreement in terrorism studies about what causes participation or vulnerability or susceptibility to violent extremist content. And, you know, there's a lot of compelling research. And if you're interested, I suggest you read some of it. However, for every bit of research, you'll have others disagreeing. But there's one thing almost everybody agrees on, and that is social alienation. This is why during the pandemic, we saw um, a huge increase in people who were um, sharing violent extremist beliefs and ideology. 
when people are isolated and they are not fully um, basically embedded in their society or within a smaller subculture, when people lack um, a family unit or if they don't have a family, they lack some type of community connection that is regular and every day that grounds them because we are social animals within the group. That is the one vulnerability that we have seen again and again, regardless of the violent extremist ideology or belief system that is a factor for people. So knowing that, knowing that alienation is a problem, when it comes to the online approach, um, there are ways to make sure that alienation, at least within an online community, is not something that's made worse by the structure or the rules of a given platform. That's where making sure that there are rules in place to not further alienate users, to make sure that there are rules in place that don't make it easy for bad actors to exploit users who are alienated. This is one of the reasons that I chose to work, to leave academia and work in industry for a while, because by tackling all the different elements of this, um, you can actually make a bigger difference than just focusing on the field itself. For example, um, some of the things that are commonplace to detect on a really functional platform include things like self-harm, a user going online and saying, I want to die or I want to hurt myself. We know somebody who is in that mindset is feeling very alienated and they're actually reaching out to an online community and they're asking, maybe in the not best way possible, for support. Platforms that are healthy will detect this content and they will elevate it as high risk. They will see that this user is at high, high risk of violence to themselves. And they will use a number of methods, including um, redirecting that user to resources. Like in the United States, a platform might direct a user like that to a suicide hotline or to other mental health resources. Um, there are also other things that can be detected. This is why cyberbullying is also important, I believe, in counterterrorism, because bullying behavior is a way to further alienate people. And we know that alienation puts people at risk, makes them more susceptible to violent extremist content. So if you have a platform where cyberbullying is absolutely not okay and where it's dealt with very quickly, then you have a healthier community where it's going to be much more obvious should you have people that are displaying signs of alienation or people displaying signs of exploiting that alienation and therefore valuing those pro-social, social cohesion kind of elements that you see in the way people interact and devaluing and flagging and enforcing the behaviors that are dangerous, that run the risk of, um, of weakening social cohesion. Both of those happening in concert are so important. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another question from Professor Samindra. Uh, he is emphasizing the primary value of education. And he is saying that, he's asking to you that, do you think only education and not counter technology will be sufficient to deal with the online crimes? I think it's a combination of all of it. Um, I, when I worked in academia, I, I was not successful in it, but one of the things that I worked on in addition to working with tech companies and the actual technologies that were concerning or even helpful in counterterrorism, um, it was my pet uh, project that I tried to get funded was a digital literacy program for students, for younger students. And one of the reasons that I think it's as important to focus on the toolkit we have for counterterrorism as it is to educate people is because we can't have one without the other. We won't succeed. And my notion is that if you work to educate people, but more specifically, you work to educate younger people who are already more savvy about online conduct and online tools and the way platforms work, those young people will actually educate the older adults in their lives. 
And those adults will learn more from the young people than they will from other adult strangers. So if you want to make a huge difference, inform young people, use what I mentioned of pre-bunking, of inoculation theory, um, empower young people to understand. You don't, of course, have the same education approach with a group of young students as you would with adults because you don't want to terrify them about what they could see online. But you do want to prepare them that this exists out there and that there are some very common sense ways to actually educate. But at the same time, it's so important that the people who are creating the technology that we need and deploying that technology understand how to use it. Just like we were just talking about a few minutes ago about how we can make monsters out of our governments if they act without understanding the fullness of their policy. The same thing can happen with technology companies. They may think they understand the problem. They may think that they have a solution, but unless they have enough people with expertise into these areas across every single language being used on a platform and with each language, multiple cultural contexts, then they are actually lacking the information they need to deploy the tech that's actually going to help. So we need both, but most importantly, we need what we're doing today, which is we're actually just talking about these issues and therefore elevating the importance of addressing them in order to improve society and make it safer for all of us across the globe. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another question from uh, Fatma Daracha, who is a research scholar. Uh, she, has, uh, she has put emphasis on cybernetics. And she's saying that uh, cybernetics helps in understanding and explaining entire political reality of every nation. So how shall we borrow much from natural science as well as from uh, cybernetics in understanding socio-economic communication and decision making at the time of crisis? How can we combat cyber attack in any country? Well, this is a little bit similar to what I was saying before with cyber warfare. We can't have um, an increasingly online society as we go into web three, where a lot of people are going to decide to exist in more of a 3D reality without understanding the implications of that. We take these things for granted sometimes in physical life. Um, if you physically go visit your bank, you are going to um, take for granted a lot of the time that they have a lot of security in place and policy to keep people and money actually safe. Their computer systems, the physical location, um, security guards, all of this. But for some reason, and I think that my colleagues get really sick of me talking about this, all of us tend to take this strange leap um, when it comes to online life, that somehow, as long as we have this great new idea of this new platform, it could be a gaming platform or a social media platform or this great dating platform, whatever it is, that people will run into that situation without thinking, what is the security situation? What is um, the diversity situation? Are people joining from all over the world? Are there kids joining as well as adults? These really, really basic things. You know, in the United States, a bar that serves alcohol exclusively is not going to let in a group of young school children. We, we take this for granted. But what then when it comes to an online um, war web three experience, sometimes people are not necessarily thinking, oh my gosh, how do we make age gating work? How do we keep, you know, people under the age of 13 or people under the age of 18 out of places that have very adult content? Um, so again, this is where the best companies that really understand these issues before they even go live, before anybody actually signs up to be a user, will have done this planning. Sometimes people rush to market and they do not think about this, but then they quickly get embarrassed about the results of not having security in place or not having safety mechanisms or not having sufficient policy. 
and then they backtrack to try to make these things safer. All of these things work together. And it's the same type of approach that professionals in international security and governments use. It's just unfortunate that we have all of this in the hands of companies. And so a single company, think about this, a single company that hosts a platform has to have a certain level of expertise in global security in order to be successful. So what we rely upon within a given country where we have an intelligence apparatus, a law enforcement, enforcement apparatus, a social support apparatus, um, we take for granted that these things exist, but a given company has to have all of that in some way, shape or form for their single platform in order to keep us safe, including safe from hacking. So it's a lot to put on a company. At the same time, these companies are making money from people joining. And so this is the cost of doing business. But I think a lot of us could look at this and say, maybe 20 years ago, we didn't anticipate that a single company would also have to either have or hire our, out the expertise to have a strong global security system in place. But that's the reality of what we're dealing with today. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another question from uh, Professor Natalia Nechaiva Yurichuk, uh, she's associate professor uh, from Ukraine. Uh, she's asking, uh, could you please define main, uh, could you please uh, 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 say something about main features of political online terrorism and its role in contemporary world? Yeah, certainly. Um, and I will say as a caveat, I, you know, I am biased towards um, a lot of the data that I've looked at. So I have specialized more on the far right than I have on other forms of extremism. Part of that is because of that being one of the dominant violent extremist ideologies in the West um, and among the research teams I've looked at. So the features of online terrorism, there are a number. I mean, we've seen, especially in the United States um, and in other places in the West, I, the, I guess we'll start with some of the worst, um, when a terrorist event is live streamed, in addition to a manifesto um, being shared. To me, this is, this is what keeps me up at night is, when that type of event occurs, um, that has a ripple effect among any community online. But what it also does is it strengthens, unfortunately, the particular violent extremist movement. So that's one um, major example when actual terrorism can be captured and packaged and sent to other platforms and shared and glorified. This is about as powerful a form of propaganda and online terrorism as you can get. Stepping down from manifestos and live streaming are some of the examples that I had shared earlier of um, recorded violence or photos of terrorist violence um, or photos of violence having occurred, gory photos of people who have been victimized, people who are um, the outgroup, so to speak. That is also a secondary feature of political, um, of terrorism online and a way of influencing people. So there are people, and we've seen this, especially in the United States, where we have such a problem with shootings and particularly mass shootings, some of them motivated by violent extremist ideologies, some of them just motivated by people who have more extreme belief systems, but don't necessarily fit that um, definition. Taking images of, um, of people who have had violence committed against them, and basically packaging them up like commodities are very, very common. This is where the study of memes is particularly important. A lot of people um, share memes, especially young people. It's a way of um, communicating with one another um, without a lot of language. And then it's supposed to be funny a lot of the time. 
and it can fly under the radar. It can be a little bit more difficult to adapt to memes that are changed constantly. Even if a platform actually discovers one particular violent meme that's associated with a terrorist group um, and they hash it, for example, someone will alter that meme just slightly and so it's no longer detected. And that's kind of second level content that is shared. And not only is it used to um, really strengthen the people who already believe in extremist ideology, it's a way to make it accessible for people who don't believe. And it's a way to de-emphasize the harmful nature of that content. So it often ends up in the hands of children who think, oh, this is kind of funny and edgy. They don't necessarily understand that it's associated with a violent extremist belief system. So it's a similar element to what um, we saw a lot in the West in the 1980s and 90s. And it still happens, but what people talk about stickering, where, say, a, a group of neo-Nazis will actually hit up a certain region and they will put up posters and stickers. And they'll have what appear to be really humorous or even um, empowering phrases They sometimes hit up college campuses. And people don't really know what it means. But if they go online now, in the past, they had to rely upon, you know, not having those online spaces. But now they can actually put these things in the physical realm. And then people go online to see what it means. And then they get pulled in to these communities where at first it won't be something that will be um, obvious. It won't be a violent extremist system. And, I, and pardon me, but I won't share some of the content because it's too toxic and it's too um, harmful to share in this type of um, forum. But they'll, they'll use phrases that make it sound like a group of people are just trying to empower themselves and align based on shared attributes or align based on shared ideas. And then they will give you more of that same content. And when you have hung around long enough in a given community, they'll start to say, oh, have you ever read this or that? And this is where they'll take you that next level in, where they won't just tell you that the shared attribute or the shared ideas are a great thing and we should celebrate that, but they'll start to point fingers. If only this group of people, if only this policy didn't exist, then what they'll start to do is, is formulate the very skeleton of what I described to violent extremism, which is that one group of people, their only hope for survival is committing violence against everybody else who doesn't believe that way. And they have to make the case for that. And the way they make the case for that is to strengthen people and build trust and then once they have some trust, they will share increasingly more hateful and discriminatory content. And they'll do so slowly and introduce the notion that violence is the only solution to that, that governments don't understand, that you can't protect yourself, that you're in peril if you don't actually commit violence. But they do so step by step by step. Um, and nowadays, they take what used to be in the form of magazines or books, and they will intersperse it with memes and with little posts here and there. So you literally see cut up pieces of what we've seen published in long form distributed within a community. Um, and again, they do so in a way that elevates, oh, we're together, we share these same ideas. And really, I'm just here to inform you about what you need to know to be okay. And that element, that introduction of your survival is in peril, is one of the distinguishing features that pushes people towards these ideas. But more specifically, there's evidence that that survival fear is what pushes people into taking acts um, of violence against others as well. Thank you, ma'am. We have another question from uh, Himanshu Bhardwaj. He is the doctoral research scholar at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He, he particularly has uh, raised the question of uh, 
development in, uh, development in the developing countries he is saying that uh, what measures should be taken by developing countries where digital literacy is a dynamic and challenging issue yeah that is a great question because we don't have i mean like i was kind of laughing about when i was in academia i could not get my digital literacy um, project off the ground it needed funding i was working in a nonprofit even when people do get funding, often these programs only last year, three years, and then the funding dries up. And in the meantime, we have all of these people across the world who need these tools now. And so this is where having open conversations with people is so important. When I was doing research for what was the most powerful way to educate young people and make them stronger, in the face of really horrific content like violent extremist content, I spoke with a former, and what I mean is a former is a former um, terrorist, and essentially, um, and he is somebody who had been completely rehabilitated and now does work to prevent other people from continuing on that path, helps disengage people, and also does research, and. I said, what are, the, what are the best ways when you, because he also talks to young people, obviously coming from his background, he can speak more powerfully to how he was drawn in as a young person, but those of us who aren't can learn from their, um, from what they've learned. And he said, one of the early signs to warn people about, warn young people about, is being very casual in terms of how they try to push other people out of their social group and how they might use slurs or insulting language. Um, it could be boys directing insulting language just towards girls, or it could be a group of people who are using a racial slur against another group and saying, oh, we don't mean it harmfully. But he said those early signs that acceptance of that type of language not only sets people up to be more vulnerable and thinking it's normal to interact that way, but actual violent extremists who are looking for communities of young people online who are vulnerable will look for those precise types of behaviors. They will look for people who seem more accepting of hatefulness, of disrespectful, insulting language. So one of the best ways that we can strengthen people, especially young people, is again, going back to what I had mentioned briefly, is to one, show up as the same person online as you are offline. If you're a really respectful, um, interactive, social person who other people enjoy interacting with offline, but all of a sudden you go online and you're insulting and you're using slurs and you're being hateful, there is a disconnect that is not only harmful to you as a person, but then you're influencing other people to do the same. And so that's where norms of behavior come into place. When we don't have the structure and the funding, which we seem to lack the world over in terms of really effective digital literacy programs, what we can do is promote norms. I like to use this example because it happened in front of our eyes. When the Me Too movement occurred, it happened and spread like wildfire across the internet. And in real life, people who had been guilty of abusing others and discriminating against others um, in that particular way were called out and they were called to account. And in some cases, they um, faced legal uh, repercussions and certainly social repercussions. If something like Me Too can be normalized where we say, you know, there are certain types of conduct that aren't okay, then there is hope for similar types of norms being enforced quickly. If we say that violent extremist ideologies are based on hate, which they are, are based on promoting violence against other people with specific attributes, which they are, then every sign of that online can be something that we say, no, that's not okay. And you know what? It doesn't matter if it's a joke. It doesn't matter if you didn't mean it that way, because that is what strengthens these systems. And so in the absence of a formal digital literacy program or curriculum, as 
people in our community, as parents or aunts or cousins or teachers, we can still um, demonstrate that there are norms of conduct, especially for young people as they are exploring more adult places online. So by the time they become 18 and there are fewer restrictions on what they're seeing and doing online, that they are actually prepared that it's just like any other hazard in the real world, that they have to be prepared to understand how to protect themselves and to understand when other people who mean them harm or who have harmful ideas are present with them in those spaces. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have the last question, and uh, this would be the last question, I think. Uh, this question is from uh, Rittiman Mukherjee. He is a doctoral research scholar at the Presidency University, Kolkata. He is asking, uh, how far do you think that uh, proliferation of online terrorism by radical Islamist outfits have contributed to the spread of Islamophobia in the West? Uh, great question. I think it's more the um, policy, the government response to radical Islamic um, terrorism than the actual content um, itself that has contributed to the spread of Islamophobia. Um, I think for the most part, if you think about everyday users online, um, I'm certainly, I mean, because of what I do for my job, it's my job to look at really horrific content. But when my job ends, um, and I choose to interact online, I am not going to places that expose me to terrorist content or to other harmful forms of content. I spend my days doing that. I spend my research time doing that. So I think a lot of people are actually not ever exposed to that content except for when the media covers it, when it becomes more of a policy issue. But the media will often cover it, cover it in terms of the government response, law enforcement response, and the biased nature and the sometimes just woefully misinformed nature that characterizes that content. That's what I believe actually contributes to the spread of Islamophobia. Um, people truly not understanding um, whole groups of people, whole religions, whole languages and cultures, um, and then trying to bottle up this particular set of issues with um, terrorism and trying to paint with a broad brush whole groups of people. So I really think that it's the government responses, counterterrorism policy, and what you know we all talk about in terms of othering. Um, here we are here and those people over there. And that's just a lazy way to indicate that we're afraid, but we're not taking the time to understand the issue. So I would, I would hope for the most part that that content isn't being viewed as much by individuals, but what they are relying upon is cues from government and from the media, which is trying to ref reflect policy and often doing so very poorly in, in as such that it creates whole fears um, that have nothing to do with the actual terrorist problem whatsoever and relies upon xenophobia and racism and other forms of hatred, which is something that I didn't bring up, but truly um, responding to violent extremism, which is based in hatred, with hatred is the worst thing that we can do. Um, it's the worst in all of us. And whenever we see that, and whenever we see that and others around us, we should call it out. I certainly do when I see it, because this is not the way that we make our spaces safer and more secure and more respectful. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, much any questions. And I think uh, uh, Christian ma'am is facing a lot of technical glitches at her side and she's not available, I think. So we shall move to the vote of thanks session. Uh, I I thank you, Professor Christine Ma'am, for uh, uh, finding time to join this uh, program as the chair. Uh, we sincerely extend our heartiest thanks and gratitude to Ms. Chris uh, McGuffey, Ma'am, uh, for accepting our invitation and for enriching us on such a burning theme. 
aspects of online terrorism uh, thank you very much for illuminating us by casting the light on several aspects related to the online terrorism and its expansion across the globe and also the landscape of uh, countering terrorism online and uh, depicting the future of online counter terrorism as not so bleak as we might think we look forward to more opportunities uh, to hear your thoughts and ideas uh, thank you very much chris ma'am for joining us we extend our profound thanks and gratitude to our vice principal sir dr ramesh kar uh, for granting his approval and providing his thorough support and encouragement in organizing this event now we would like to thank the president of the governing body of our institution dr, uh, dr. sudhir roy and all the respected members of the governing body for their constant moral support our thanks also go to uh, dr subhajit ghosh sir uh, bursar and nac coordinator of our college and uh, to professor sadhunath kundu uh, coordinator of the iqac and professor praveer kanti basu secretary teachers council of uh, our institution for their continued moral support uh, our sincere thanks also go to professor devdas de uh, the head of the department at the uh, head at the department of political science uh, for his unwavering support and guidance throughout uh, we would also like to thank dr abdul khaliq an assistant professor at the department of physics uh, for uh, providing the technical assistance to this program our vote of thanks also go to professor dev tanumaji professor kamal roy and professor anandita mitra all at the department of political science for their continued support in organizing this webinar we extend our heartiest thanks to all the teaching and non teaching staff of our institution for their moral support a special thanks goes to all our students at the department of political science for their enthusiastic participation last but not the least our sincere thanks go to all the respected participants present here uh, for their active participation and for making this event a huge success thank you very much uh, we look forward to see you all in our forthcoming programs i wish you all the best uh, have a wonderful time good night thank you take care take care uh, feedback link has been shared in the chat box uh, please kindly i request all of you to please uh, fill